what is a hedge fund? Let's look inside the semi-secret hedge fund world. So 20 years ago, I took the most fascinating investment course. It's the most, by far the most in-depth uh, uh, investment course I've taken. It was called the Certified Hedge Fund Specialist course. Um, and actually, I loved it so much. I, I actually worked worked like mad on it, really studied hard. I got the top mark in Canada. It was, it was really cool. And what I learned from it is this entire hedge fund world is just so different from the rest of the investing world. It's, and it's so interesting. And there's so many interesting stories from it. So what I want to do is in this video is I want to give you a sense of what this world is like. You find it's completely different from the investing world you know. And there's a lot of interesting stories that you know that are all related to all this. So I'll give you some insight and some uh, from my view as a you know a, a growth focused uh, fee for service financial planner, how I see this hedge fund world and how it could be useful for us. So you know you've probably heard a lot of things about hedge funds, and the question is, are these true? Like, is it mostly rich people? Is that where they have their money? Are are they all secret? Are they unregulated? Right. So, um, uh, and there's been some major blowups. Why does that happen? You know, are they risky or not? So, and are they super complex? Uh, what kind of people manage hedge funds? So, we're going to get talk about all that kind of stuff. And so, basically, it's it, you know, the video is about what's a, what is a hedge fund. Uh, I'll give you a look at the inside of it and what it really looks like from the inside. Should you invest in a hedge fund? And I'm going to talk about some, you know, movies that you know and stories you know about hedge funds. And, uh, you know, so we actually have like our clients have a hedge fund that is found by one of our portfolio managers. So let's talk about why that uh, why that is. So this is a really big topic. So let's, this is just kind of an overview of it. And it's my, my view as a fee-for-service growth-focused advisor or how I see it. That's what I'm going to give you from this. Okay, so what we're going to learn today is uh, what is a hedge fund? Um, in the inside view of the semi-secret world of hedge funds. So what is a hedge fund? I'll give you an example of a hedge fund strategy, the pros and cons of hedge funds versus mutual funds and ETFs. I'll give you talk about the 12 categories of hedge fund strategies. You'll find it's super broad. Uh, are, are they more risky? or less risky than mutual funds and ETFs. I'll give you talking about some stories of behind the major blowups and even some movies about hedge fund managers. You probably know these movies. And I'll talk to give you the whole view of the inside, inside the hedge fund world. Should you invest in one? And why do our clients have a hedge fund? So, all right. So first of all, what is a hedge fund? So now you, know, you may think of this elaborate way to make a ton of money. What it actually is, it's mostly about steadier returns, not about higher returns. So you probably, you probably know the term hedge your bets. So hedge your bets is to, you know, uh, you're betting one way, but you're going to bet another way to uh, in case that main bet goes wrong. That's kind of what hedge fund is. It's mostly about reducing uh, risk, getting steadier returns, not about getting higher returns. So the other thing about it is, uh, it's actually a hedge fund is not really an invest specific investment. It's a strategy, not investment. So they buy stocks and bonds and just like any, like anything, like, a, you know, just like you would in a mutual fund or ETF. However, they always have a strategy around it. So it's the strategy that makes it a hedge fund, not the actual investments they have. Uh, the big thing about it is that uh, they look for, you know, I'll give you a few terms to learn. One is alpha, which in the industry is, is used to mean the, the, the value that the manager adds to your rate of return. Okay. So with mutual funds, the saying is that with mutual funds and ETFs, it's 80% the market and 20% skill of the fund manager. With hedge funds, it's the opposite. It's the you know eighty percent skill, twenty percent the market. In fact, you know it matters. Um, uh, it, it, that's that's is a bit exaggerated, but that's kind of the thing. It's mainly skill and not the market. So, all right. So let me give you an example, and that's going to show it. So um, let's say that you think that, or the fund manager thinks that Bank of Montreal uh, is going to do better than Royal Bank. OK, so now what, what you can do with, with uh, in investments, so usually you're used to, you know, you're probably familiar with buying shares of a company, but you can also do what's called selling short, short selling. So selling short um, 
means you own negative shares, okay? So technically it's, you know, you borrow shares from someone and sell them, and then you eventually have to give them back. So, but just think of it as I have negative shares. So instead of a hundred shares, I have negative a hundred shares. That means I now make money if the fund goes down and uh, instead of getting dividends, I have to pay the dividends. So it's the opposite, okay? So just think of it that way. So now I think Bank of Montreal is going to do better than uh, better than Royal Bank. So I buy Bank of Montreal and I short Royal Bank of negative shares of Royal Bank. Now, if I do this right and they're balanced, what happens is I make money in all markets as long as Bank of Montreal is better than Royal Bank. It doesn't matter if there's a market crash or the market takes off or what happens. There's no The market itself has no effect. As long as I'm right about Bank of Montreal doing better than Royal Bank, well, I make money. Okay. So that's an example of a hedge fund strategy. And so see, it's entirely about the skill. Are are you right that Bank of Montreal is going to do better than Royal Bank? If you're right, then you make money. So it's so it's not about what happens in the market. That's just an example of a hedge fund strategy, but I want to show you how that actually works. So now let's just talk about the advantages and disadvantages of a hedge fund versus you know mutual fund or ETF. So first of all, with a hedge fund, you can make money in up markets and down markets. Okay, they can make money in both ways. So, all right. So the manager, the manager is uh, usually paid to outperform. So there's a performance fee. So he gets paid an extra amount. Um, the, typically, it's you know twenty percent above uh, above the index or above a, uh, a a hurdle rate or something like that. But the manager gets a has a bonus to outperform. There's much much wider investment options and strategies that's possible. You can do leverage within the fund to a certain extent, um, and it may not be affected by market volatility. Like most, pretty well all the strategies are less affected by market volatility. Almost all of them, and some are not. You know, the market neutral fund is not affected at all by markets, by market volatility. And you know what? The, the cool thing is, they actually have really in-depth risk management software. And they have tons of stats. So I've I've been actually I've been to see when I when I when you go to do diligence on a hedge fund, they have this massive software with a you know like a hundred different statistics, and they're always looking at like not only the one strategy. Remember, so a fund may have many different strategies, and how do they all interact? And they can figure, they have this really in-depth uh, risk management that's usually part of it. So, so, you know, mutual funds and ETFs mostly just have standard deviation, just the basic, but it's, you know, far more in-depth with hedge funds. So and I, an example of it is, so this is an example just uh, um, with a hedge fund, they usually show you monthly returns, not, you know, not just, you know, one, three and five year or calendar year, they actually show you the monthly returns. So if you look at this, you see this fund made money, you know, most months. And if you look down the, the years, notice it's made money every single year, it's made money. Okay. So that's the kind of thing you can often see with a hedge fund is, is that they show you all these monthly returns because it's about consistency of returns, not about high returns in most of the time. So now let's talk about disadvantages. So first of all, you may not get the market growth. So you know what? Like, so a lot of people think, oh yeah, I'm I'm not I'm immune to the market growth, so I can just make money if I'm skilled. But you know what? The market goes up most of the time. You know, like it typically doubles every seven years, and so you're actually giving up all that market growth. So that's one disadvantage. Uh, they tend to have higher fees. So, um, you know, a, a very a common one is, you know, they, they call it two and 20. So the fund manager will charge 2% plus 20% above a benchmark or a hurdle rate or something like that. So the, the, the fees can tend to be higher. But, you know, to some extent, it can make sense if you have a really skilled fund manager and it's a much harder uh, method of investing. So it kind of makes sense that he's, and he's, uh, uh, and he's paid to outperform, but you know you are paying kind of higher fees in there. You know, so you need a skilled manager to be able to be worthwhile. So now there's high minimums to get in. Most of the time, you need 150 thousand as a minimum investment to get in, and then usually like five thousand for each additional amount. Now, if you're what's called an accredited investor, you can get in for between five and 25,000 and sometimes for, uh, you know, with no minimum at all. So there are exceptions to the high minimum. So now an accredited investor, um, there's a bunch of options for it, but the main ones are you have uh, a 1 million net worth and that's excluding real estate. That's financial assets only. Uh, you have an income of 200,000 yourself the last two years or family income, you and your spouse of over 300,000. 
Uh, or if you're a client of an independent portfolio manager. So our clients are all, we refer them to, uh, like we do the financial planning as a fee-for-service planner, and then we refer them to independent portfolio managers. So they can actually uh, get into a hedge fund if that's what the portfolio manager chooses. So, all right. So now these independent portfolio managers, uh, they are the, um, the only people um, in the investment world in Canada that have a fiduciary duty to do what's in your best interest. Okay. So that's, Part of what makes sense is part of why, because they have this fiduciary duty, that's why they have the ability to, you know, to put a hedge fund in your portfolio if that's what you want. And most most fund managers, do, uh, you know, can't do that. So um, uh, hedge funds, another disadvantage is that they can often be hard to find. A lot of them don't publish stats. It's, you know, a lot of it's by word of mouth. So a lot of it is hard to, hard to find them or how to get stats about them. So it's not like, like most of them are not on, you know, Morningstar that you can analyze them or on the internet. You got to find the stats somehow. So uh, they're also very complex and harder to understand. So, so remember, it's not an investment, it's a strategy. So you have to always understand the strategies on there. You know, if you saw the holdings of a hedge fund, you, you probably wouldn't know what it's doing because no holding is there as a holding. Everything is, is in there because of strategy, right? You know, for example, in the last example, you'd see that they have, uh, you know, they have Bank of Montreal and they're in a short Royal Bank, but you'd see them among a list of a whole bunch of other holdings. So you don't necessarily see that that's a specific strategy that they're doing. So, so the risk here is not as much less market rich risk and much more about the manager skill. So, you know, I love Warren Buffett's statement. He says, risk is not knowing what you're doing. And it just really applies to hedge funds. It's really what, where the risk is. So the general recommendation that I have is um, don't buy these things without, an, uh, without uh, you know, advice. Sometimes there's, you know, there's talk about making them available to the wider market with liquid alts or hedge fund notes or something. And you got to be careful of this because you're buying a complex strategy. And if you don't understand what the fund manager is doing, then don't buy it. You got to understand what it is and what the pros and cons of it are. So now there are 12 categories of hedge fund strategies to give you a sense of what they are. So I'm going to quickly kind of go through these and tell you a little bit of story about each one so you see what they are. But it'll give you a sense of how wide of a, of a world this all this all is. It's actually really, really cool when you see it. So this is 12. I've, uh, some people say there's 14 or 16, but anyway, these are the kind of the main, the main ones from this. And uh, so I'll tell you, so you can see, this is a little note. Um, there's just little stories or interesting things that have happened in each of these areas that have actually, uh, you know, I, I want to just kind of give you a sense of what these are all like. So, all right. So the first one is options. Uh, all right. So, so first of all, before we can get into the strategy, you have to understand what an option is. So an, uh, an option is an option to buy, a sh usually a share. So for example, a typical option is to buy 100 shares of a stock at a specific price before a certain date. Okay. So usually they're fairly short, 90 to 180 days. Um, and so just to give you an example of, of what happens with an option. So let's say you pay $2 to buy an option to buy a hundred shares of a company. Um, the stock is at $18 a share now, but your option is to buy it for $20 a share. Okay. So now if, if it, at, when the option expires, the price is below $20, you, your option is worth worthless and you just lost your two bucks. Okay. But if it's above 20 bucks, you get that difference. So if it's at $22, then, um, you know, you so you you can buy the share for twenty uh, two and uh, so for twenty and sell for twenty two. You make two bucks on it, and it costs you two, so you break even. All right. So, but let's say the stock price leaps up to thirty bucks. So, um, you now made a profit of ten bucks on an investment of only two bucks. So you made five hundred percent on your money. So, what's happening with a call option is um, this kind of option is you've got a leveraged gain, but also a, a high chance of a you know of a uh, of losing 100% of your money. So the truth is the vast majority of options actually expire worthless. All right. So now there's two kinds of options. There's call options, which are option to buy and put options, which are option to sell. Now, remember, we also talked about short selling. So you can also short 
a call option and short a put option. So like, so for example, if you short a call option, that it's not an option to sell. It's, uh, well, it's, it's an option that someone else can buy your shares. <laughs> okay. So it's an option to sell, but the other guy has the option, not you. So, all right. So th those are kind of the options. You got to kind of see how they work in a strategy. So now let's see what an option does in a strategy. So the there's a there are a bunch of different option strategies. If you see these combine two or three or four different options, uh, and you know butterfly strategies and something. But the most common common one you've probably co come across is a covered call option. Okay. Now with every option strategy, you're gaining something and you're losing something. So you have to when you when you get into the strategy, make sure you understand what are you getting from the strategy and what are you losing. Okay. So now, uh, so yeah, call option, it's it's leverage growth above the strike price, but 100% loss if it's not, okay? So now, so covered call option strategy, what you do is you sell an option um, and you own the stock. So I own shares of a stock and I also sell an option, okay? An option to buy it. That means the person who I sell it to has the option to buy my stock at that price. So now I get a premium from this. I, so I collect two bucks. And so this is where this is done sometimes as a strategy is you just own a stock. And on top of that, you sell options every once in a while and you get these premiums. And if they don't take your stock away, you just keep collecting these extra premiums. So that's a, you know, income on top of what, the, what your stock makes. You still own the stock, right? So that's the interesting part of it. You're kind of getting steady income on top of owning the stock, right? But now, so if, in the same example, the stock's at 18 and, and you're it's somebody can buy it from you at 20. So if it stays below 20 bucks, uh, the, the share of the, the price, then you just get to keep that $2 premium and you still own the stock, right? The option ex expires worthless, like I can't take away your stock. So you just made two bucks and you still have the stock. Now, if it rises, the share price rises above 20 bucks, then the other buyer is going to take away, he's going to buy your shares at 20 bucks. So basically, that's the maximum you could sell your share for 20 bucks. Now, the interesting thing is that's not the worst thing because it was at $18. Now it's gone to 20. So you made a profit of two bucks plus you got the $2 premium. So you just made $4, right? So, so you've still made some money. So now the thing is if it drops, let's say the share price drops to 10 bucks, you still lose, uh, you, you're, you, you've, you, it's at 18 bucks. It falls to 10. You still lose all the money. So you're not protected on the downside other than the fact that you get to keep the $2 premium if it falls, right? So you still, it still lose money if it goes down. Now, if it shoots up to 30 bucks, the other guy's going to buy your shares at, at 20 and you missed all that extra growth, okay? So let's talk about what you gain and what you lose, okay? So you still have 100% of the downside risk, but your upside is capped, okay? However, you get this premium income. So that's, so is that overall, are you ahead or behind? Depends a lot on the situation. So now when I see these strategies, there are actually funds you can buy that just do this option strategy. And some of them are just mutual funds that do it. So um, usually they tend, they have lower returns long-term than if they just had just had a regular equity fund. Yeah. All right. And, and the reason is because the market actually goes up, you know, most of the time. And there's actually a lot of big gains. So, you know, if you look at, you know, calendar years, the stock market has a gain of over 20 percent, basically four out of 10 years. So, you know, so there's a lot of big gains. And that's why you tend you'd think, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the steady income. I own my share. And I still get the steady income. And if someone buys it away, I just buy the shares back and I still got the steady income. So you think you're doing well. But uh, the truth is, you, you're going to, every once in a while, the stocks will take off and you're going to lose all that. So in general, when I look at these option strategies or the uh, covered call option funds, long term, they usually have lower returns than just a basic equity fund. But you get the steady income, but it's lower returns than in most cases. So, no. all right. So now what you're doing here is it's you're getting this, um, uh, uh, you're getting this lower uh, income. You know, and thing is that you you want to think you want to think of getting a higher uh, income. So you need to be people would buy bonds to get a more steady. They're trying to get income out of it. So, but thing is, you need to get a high return, like an eight percent. I've had a few videos on this that you need like an equity rate of return, like say eight percent a year, 
in order to retire comfortably. So if you get a bit lower return, like you've taken a more conservative investment. So most of the time, these um, option-based strategies like this wouldn't give you a 5%. It'd be usually higher than that. This is what you get from a balanced portfolio. But my point is, if you're if you're getting a too conservative of a return, so 5% per year may not sound like a bad rate, bad rate of return. But if you're trying to invest, uh, trying to retire, you know, 30 years from now, reasonably comfortably, you probably have to invest between 35 and 50% of your income if you're only getting a 5 percent rate of return but only between 13 and 20 percent you know max your rsp for example if you're getting a, an equity rate of return so this so, so it's why it's important to keep this you know it's a fear-based mindset that often gets people to buy these hedge funds or things and uh, so it's better not to have that and stay with the growth you know if you want to get the higher rate of return all right, the next strategy is called merger arbitrage. So this is, uh, this is a strategy that, that tries to capitalize on the specific event, such as a merger, uh, merger right, or a bankruptcy or a spinoff or something like that. So um, so to give you an example of what it is, so, uh, you know, company A is going to buy out company B at a certain price. And usually what happens is um, the company B rises up to that. Usually it's a, it's a, the offer is quite a bit higher than what it's uh, currently trading at. It jumps up a ways and by, by the final buyout day, the price is going to rise that amount. Okay. So it's, as long as the merger goes through, it's definitely going to go up to that amount. All right. So you can, so the idea is that you, um, you sell the, the buying company and you, you buy the company that's, uh, that's being bought. Okay. So then again, you've, you've, uh, you've gone essentially, mostly essentially market neutral. And this is, um, and, um, when the merger goes through, you get the final price and you've made that bit of a profit. Okay. So what happens with this is you get a very high chance, as long as this deal goes through, you have a very high chance of getting a small, a modest, regular gain. Okay. So, and so when I look at hedge funds, often I see the, the ones that have the best you know, long-term rate of return are often these merger arbitrage ones. You know, you look at, uh, they have a 10-year track record and they've made money almost every single month and they have made money every year and they've averaged, you know, 15% a year for 10 years with no losses. It's usually a merger arbitrage. Okay. But what happens here is, and it's because they can always make a little bit steady on, on each one. All right. So and so part of what the fund manager has to do is they really have to study the buyout agreement and look at all the motivations of the underlying of the of the managers that run these two companies and make sure that goes through. Because the problem is, if the deal falls through for any reason, your company is going to collapse and you lose a bunch of money. And usually it's quite a bit. So you make so the 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 term used for it is picking up dimes in front of a steamroller. All right. So you just make up you make a bit of money, bit of money, steady, 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 and all of a sudden, bam, you lose a, a, a whole bunch of it. And that's what I sometimes see with these. Um, I think it's it's something you, people may not see with a uh, with a hedge fund is you look at something that's got a ten year track record, it's made money every single year, and it's steady, 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 and then all of a sudden it loses thirty percent in one year. You think, what the hell happened, right? And it's this kind of thing. It's it's because that's a bit of the, how the strategy works, and it's something you need to know that about the strategy. So it's right. So a lot of times, you know, it's they'll they have lawyers that are studying it, and you know they're try, really trying to make sure that this deal, uh, the deal the way it's written, is actually going to go through. So so it's probably the most consistent of the hedge fund strategies. Um, but um, what happens with it? Sometimes the um, Sometimes there just aren't a lot of deals. Like how well the funds do generally is mostly based on how many deals there are. All right. So when the market is strong, a lot of companies are buying each other out and often they're using their shares to buy out, you know, to buy out another company because their shares have gone up. So, and so that you see a lot of uh, mergers going on and that's a really good time for merger arbitrage funds. And then often when it's down, you think that's the time when, you know, you should be buying these companies while they're down, but, but often companies have, have less uh, to be a, a um, less money or a share value to be able to to trade in exchange for the new shares, so there's, you see less volume. So what, what you see with merger, merger arbitrage sometimes there's just not a good market. There's a lot of, not a lot of mergers going on, so it's hard for them to make money. Uh, strategy uh, hedge fund strategy number three is the market neutral strategy. So here is what you're trying to do is 
uh, you're trying to own a bunch of uh, stocks that all offset each other. So you have no market risk and still make money trying to get a steady rate of return. So I'll tell you a story that this is about 20 years ago. Um, I looked at a hedge fund. The, the fund manager was a guy named John Schmitz. And he was, you know, possibly the smartest person I've ever met. He had a PhD, a super high IQ, and he had this really in-depth model. So um, so he would uh, he was buying a whole bunch of shares. They also short the same number of shares, so no market exposure. And he would make sure that it's, you know, it's sector neutral, same exposure to each sector, and beta neutral, like so beta is the degree of up and down it it, it goes. So that's it's not like you're shorting in higher risk or lower risk stocks, right? And then he he uh, his model, he studied what is moving the market at the moment. He had 120 factors that would move the market at the moment. So he's seeing what moves the market right now and he's short everything uh, or like then he always market neutral plus um he had a deal with the with with the broker because he was doing a large volume always buying and selling at the close like so he only do a buy once once a week on friday at the close which provided a lot of liquidity so they actually paid him to do it so his his um trading commissions was a revenue source it actually made money for him so that this is such a cool thing he's got what a great model that he's got and you watched him for a while and you know what happened with it is it ended up making you know i don't know, like two three four percent rate of return like it was a very steady but very low rate of return you know not a lot more than a money market fund and it's, so it's hard to kind of be be able to, when you're all market neutral like this you're not it's not you know a lot of there's hardly basically no market risk but it's also hard to make money at it so it's a really intriguing kind of strategy like you think you could do it like he actually looked at taking a you know an um uh, S and P five hundred ETF and clipping this on, so that way you always make two or three or four percent a year more than the index. So that's kind of a cool thought. So, um, but anyway, so that's what happened with the equity market neutral. It's it's another one of the strategies. Uh, strategy number four is called relative value, and it's when you have. Um, uh, two securities that are you know, not convertible to each other, but related. So for example, you have a holding company and that owns a bunch of companies, but but you have un underlying companies and you buy one and sell another one. Another example is you can sometimes have the same share, the same stock is trading on two different stock exchanges. So it's on the Toronto Stock Exchange, but it's also on the New York Stock Exchange. And if the prices are a little bit different, you buy one and sell the other and you just made a little bit of profit. So, and that's actually important for the market, right? It keeps, uh, keeps the price is the same you, you wonder why when there's different stocks that are uh the, the same stock on different exchanges is always the same price and that's why there's people like this arbit they call it arbitrage you know arbitrage you're betting against yourself uh in, in equal amounts but because they do that they they actually you know help to keep liquidity in the market and keep the integrity of their prices so now strategy number five is fixed income arbitrage Okay. Now this is kind of interesting. So now basically what, what you're doing is what we're trying to do before with, with, with stocks, but they're doing it with bonds. Okay. So you're thinking, well, bonds are less risky. And now we're just getting this, uh, you know, uh, I'm finding different values between, you know, the longer and shorter bonds or, or bonds in different countries. And then I hedge for the currency difference. So, um, so there's, you know, that's the kind of the strategy behind it. Okay. Now you'd think it would be uh, kind of uh, cool, but the problem is that bonds don't have a low rate of return anyway. And now you're doing arbitrage. So the only way that you can make money on this really is if you do a lot of leverage with it. Okay. So now I, I've already had, you know, a video about the high risk of bonds and people think bonds are not risky, but they bonds actually have higher risk. They have, you know, you can lose all your money plus the, you know, currency effect of it. And, and the big one is inflation eats them up. So they're, they appear, people, you know, get mesmerized by, oh, it's an income thing. So therefore it's low risk, but bonds actually have, you know, can have a pretty high risk of, of this. Now, the big story in the fixed income arbitrage area is, is long-term capital. So back in 1997, you probably heard the collapse of this long-term capital. Now, long-term capital was, again, it was a fund that should have everything going for it. They had a bunch of the top uh, PhDs and uh, university professors and investment guys, some of the most brilliant people in the investment industry had created this complex strategy. And because they were so sure of their strategy, they actually leveraged it 10,000 to one. Now, part of it, they had to do it because of bonds and they're not paying much. So, 
but 10,000 to one. And they actually had, you know, had started up with a good track record. Lots of people were investing their money in it. So, um, but then what happened is, you know, the, there was the collapse of the Russian ruble that was the real killer for it. Now they had hedged for part of it, but they had, you know, thought it, they thought it might fluctuate, but it actually collapsed. So it was part of a, you know, it's a emerging markets, uh, emerging markets uh, uh, currency event going on at the time. Now these math geeks said it was this was basically impossible. It was a seven sigma event. They call it something that shouldn't happen. But it did happen, you know, and so and they ended up losing most of their money. So, again, it's a case of where it made steady, steady, good rate of returns and brilliant people and all of a sudden lost a bunch of money. So, again, you have to understand what what they're doing and think of this thing is it's um, you think how you protect against this because they were smart and they did know what they're doing. Right. So. What I find sometimes it's just the really big hedge funds are the ones that tend to most likely blow up. Things often work better on a smaller scale. It's often the really biggest one that's the one that blows up. So uh, now, incidentally, another similar example that's not a hedge fund is remember 2008, the subprime mortgage collapse again. So that was again, a bond related It was money market funds. So I remember being out there at the times people were saying, Oh yeah, we can, you can get a money market fund that pays 6%. And I thought it's not, and it's no risk. It's just government. Like, you know, it's all mortgage it's all government. Don't worry. It's all guaranteed at 6%. I was thinking, there's no way it pays 6% if there's no risk. So, and you know what, if it's, if I don't understand what the risk is, I'm not going to recommend it. And it turns out it was, you know, these subprime mortgages. And again, math geeks had put tons of mortgages in a package and they thought, well, it's because the package will be fine. Again, they called it a seven sigma event when real estate collapsed and they, and they couldn't support all these mortgages. So, but it's, I mean, that's a non hedge fund example that was kind of, it's a similar kind of to long-term capital where it's, they're taking a fixed income investment, like a bond or money market fund and trying to make a ton of money on it with a math geek formula and you know it kind of blows up so strategy number six is convertible arbitrage so now when, when you know you you you, you know there's a company have both kind of stocks and have bonds but there's actually all kinds of different um parts of the capital structure of a company so they can have convertible bonds they can have warrants and options and preferred shares and convertible preferred shares and sometimes even split payment where you get you only get the dividend or the growth or the growth of owning a share there's all kinds of different versions of it so now convertible uh, arbitrage takes an one one security is convertible into another it looks for a mispricing of it okay now this is where where you you, you need to learn the word derivative now you, you've probably heard of a derivative as some you know fancy word but really all it means it's an investment that derives it gets its price from another investment so for example you know convertible bond you can you you're just a bond and you're just getting interest however you have the option at any point to convert it into shares of that company at a certain price so if the if it's way like if the price that you can buy it at is way lower than what the price is actually at this thing just trades like a bond okay but if the price gets uh, the uh, if the share price falls below it and so the, your your purchase price is above it then this convertible bond is going to move just like the stock because it's uh, it goes up and down with it Okay, so it's kind of interesting. Convertible bond can move like the stock, or it can move like the bond, depending on where the prices are. Okay, now convertible bond, what you do is you buy the bond and you sell the shares. Now remember, you can you can clear this out anytime by converting it at that price. Okay, so again, they're looking for it makes sense if the price is out of whack. You know, you can buy it at a certain price. So you know, if it gets out of whack, for example, you can buy the convertible bond, sell it to the to the uh, sell the uh, convert it to the stock, and then immediately sell it and make a profit. So that's the kind of strategy that you know, convertible arbitrage like that. When they find mispricings, they can make like a basically a guaranteed profit for just doing a couple of transactions. Um, so convertible arbitrage is kind of an in interesting prices there strategy there um so generally with this convertible arbitrage you get kind of a low steady rate of return with it and you know the biggest uh disadvantage of this strategy is there have been fewer and fewer convertible um uh, convertible investments there used to be a lot more convertible bonds there are now and so there's just fewer and fewer of these you can do them with warrants and options and futures that are, that convert into the bond but there's fewer of them so often it's just hard to and there's more people that are looking at mispricings so it's harder to make money with the strategy now 
So those, all these, the first six strategies are all, you know, we call them relative value. They're, you know, so they're usually trying to not have market risk and you're comparing the different risk of, of similar investments. Okay. Then there's a few hedge fund strategies. We call them directional. Okay. Where it's, where you're making money based on, uh, so they're not market neutral. They're making money on, for, for different methods. The most common here is called is the called the long short equity. So this is um, basically you can um, it's basically like a mutual fund, except they can also short. Okay, so so they can have a positive a number of shares or a negative amount of shares. Now um, this is only one of the twelve strategies, but it is the most common one. So when you see it's uh, it's probably I don't know thirty to fifty percent of all hedge funds are long short equity, and you know the very first hedge fund was a long short equity. It was a guy named Alfred Jones in nineteen forty nine, created a long short fund. So but, you know at that time there were mutual funds out, and he just created the first mutual fund that could also shell sell short, you know negative shares, and he had actually great really good, really good long term returns, and that's what's kind of sparked this whole hedge fund world way back, way back then. So the term they often use for this is mutual funds on steroids, right? So you can you can buy a mutual fund, you can leverage it up, or you can also short so you could make money on the downside. And the thing is, it can be done to off to reduce risk, but also to increase risk, um, all right? Increase returns. So for example, you uh, you you buy something you think is going to go up, but at the same time you sell short a related security that you think is going to go down, and you so you can you can kind of goose your returns this way. So now again, it's um, you know it's mostly manager skill, and and uh, you know much less of it is um, is market related. Okay, now they say eighty percent manager, twenty percent uh, market. It's I guess it's somewhat related. It depends a lot on how they work on it. Um, one of the problems here is um, there's a fair number of mutual fund managers that figure, you know what, I can do some shorting, and and so and they switch over to the hedge fund because they can charge higher fees, and they think they're getting, they're, they're just going to make uh, more money. The thing about it is, and you can be a really good mutual fund uh, manager, but a hedge fund is a completely different animal. Okay, so. Um, uh, it's a, and I'll explain to you in a minute why you can you know short selling is much more risky than than like it's having a negative shares is more risky than having uh, owning the shares actually so short selling is more more risky than um, than just owning the shares and it's a completely different um, strategy because you're you're just trying to take care of the market and diversify you're actually trying to make make calls so we see I see quite a few examples of really good mutual fund managers that become hedge fund managers and they're just not that good at it and you know they're and they kind of tight and dies out because the returns are lousy and nobody buys them right so however if you can have a great fund manager these are actually the best investments so it's you know even for us growth investors um you know, most of the hedge funds are less risky than the market. And um, so it's, we'd, you know, I'd rather just go through some ups and downs and get a higher long-term rate of return with a regular mutual fund or ETF um, than most, most of the hedge fund strategies. But uh, but um, if you have a long short strategy with a really good fund manager, so it's the, the same guy that you could actually be an excellent rate of return. So our clients actually have one. So I've been, you know, kind of an insider in the hedge fund world and our portfolio manager, one of them is actually insider there as well. And so one of the all-star fund managers that that is in their portfolio has a hedge fund and has been running it for a while and really knows what he's doing. And it's actually done better than his mutual fund. So again, more steady and higher returns over time. So this can be the sweet spot where you get the highest long-term rate of return, but you really have to know your fund manager, right? So it's you got it's all about the fund manager skill. So this is often where you should look for the best ones, but make sure you know what the fund manager is and what, what he's doing. Okay, strategy number eight, the second directional one is what's called short sellers. Okay, so these are interesting. So these are these are guys that just sell short. So basically all the stocks they have, they have negative ownership of it, right? So they're betting on, what they're doing is they're betting on things that are going down. So usually they find companies that are that are way overpriced and they'll short them. And actually there's some, you know, there's been uh, uh, some common ones, like for example, is one that's found a, it was a, a Chinese company. They, they got away from the hedge, from the uh, regulations because it was a Canadian company that owned wood, um, 
uh, forest uh, lumber yards in China. And because it was happening all in China, the Canadian regulators, and we have, you know, 13 regulators in Canada, nobody could find out about them. So as a hedge fund guy that actually uh, identified that this was a scam, they didn't really own all this lumber, even though it was, it was, again, it was a Canadian stock that was doing well on Toronto Stock Exchange, but it was a scam. So I, I was a hedge fund manager will sometimes find a scam. And what they'll do is they'll sh sell it short, and then they'll publicize what they what they find out. And if it turns out to be true, they make money from it. So. Now, often they'll just take things that have gone into a bubble, you know. Uh, it's funny, like a couple of years ago, Tesla had gotten really high and a bunch of people were selling short Tesla because they thought it was too high. It's going to come down. And, you know, it's a super risky game because, because here's what happens. So if you own a stock, if you just own a stock, the worst that can happen is you hundred go you lose a hundred percent, right? So it goes to zero, you lose a hundred percent. That's the worst case. But if it goes up, you could make way more than a hundred percent. You could make a they call it a ten bagger. You could make a thousand percent if your share is worth ten times what it starts with. Okay, so and it's really there's no no there's no limit to how high a stock can go. So now shorting is the opposite. So if you if you're sh negative shares, the most you can make is a hundred percent, and yet you can lose an infinite amount. So if you short a company like Tesla, you, you think, oh, I think it's overvalued, so I'm going to short it. But it you know the, it it shoots up to ten times its value. You, you've just lost. So you've lost ten times your investment. So that's why short selling is way riskier than uh, you know owning the actual owning the share. Um, you really got to be careful with, uh, with with what happens. And you know, if you if you if you're a short seller and you have it on a from a from a brokerage firm, you have to provide security based on how much it's worth. So, um, so you can even though you still haven't sold your position, you can be required to come up with more and more money. You can kind of be forced out of it. So now the movie that you may have seen that well, about this is called The Big Short. Okay, and uh, I think a lot of people saw it and just saw it of a bunch of a super, super cocky math geeks and just saw the story. But because I understand what short sellers are, I just saw this really differently. So you know, most short sellers are actually this kind they're kind of disagreeable difficult people they're usually they're usually arrogant math geeks super smart and they're the ones that they find something that you know the, the most investors think this you know the stock is going to go way up and you know but they know better and they're going to they're going to sell it and so it's this this kind of personality is a lot of what the short sellers are all right so now, the interesting thing in that movie is you notice that a lot of them had so th there they had seen the subprime investments and they realized, you know what, these things are way overvalued. There's a problem. There's a scam with them. So we're going to sell them short because we know they're going to collapse. OK, now, the thing is, in the end, they were right with a whole bunch of them were were uh, so they would buy the ones with the most junk mortgages in them that they thought would collapse and they'd sell them short. Right. So that if they collapse, they make money and they were right which ones and they did collapse. The problem is that in between they went up and they kept having to come up, come up with more and more money and uh there were some big guys trying to you know prop up these things so that they so that they couldn't make money and so a lot of them actually were forced to sell their position before they could collect you know before it actually went down so even though they were right they ended up losing money on it so so the the line that that is kind of interesting here is from John Maynard Keynes, you know, one of the great um, ec economists from from a, a hundred years ago. His line was, "The market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent," and that sometimes applies to to short sellers. So now, where you've seen short sellers more recently is some of these meme meme stocks. So I mean, a bunch of investors on uh, or just do it yourselfers on Reddit. Um, would find out about a company. So the first one they got into was GameStop. So GameStop is, you know, it's a video game store. I used to buy video games there. So it's, you know, kind of a nice little company, but it was, you know, on the verge of bankruptcy, it was going nowhere and the shares were really low and the short sellers were, were dumping on it because they realized, oh, this is a crappy stock and it's probably, it's going bankrupt. So let's just sell it now, sell it short. And then see so if, you, if you're, if a company, if you sell short, so you have negative, I own a negative hundred shares and the company goes bankrupt, um, you know, I get to keep the money from selling it at the high price and I don't have to pay it back because the company's gone bankrupt. Right? So that was what, what kind of what, what they were doing with it. So, now on Reddit, the people there, I think they um they misread it. So they tend to think short sellers are destroying good stocks, and short sellers are these big guys, you know, 
picking on the little guys and you know trying to wipe out a good company like GameStop that buys a video games that sells video games that we like to buy and the problem is short sellers are usually not big guys they're usually the little guys with these little cocky guys who are trying to pick on a company that they think is inflated so it was it's not the big guys at all that they're picking on so and so what what um so some of them actually got wiped out from this because it, um, they, they took a company like GameStop. And and um, so a whole bunch of people just bought it. So it was already overvalued and going bankrupt. But now they've run it up to a ridiculous price. And the short sellers, again, got they call it a short squeeze. The price goes up and up and up. So remember, you've invested 1000 but you've lost 10000 on it. It's still going worse and worse because the share keeps going up and you have a negative shares on it, right? So they've kind of forced a lot of them out. out. And again, it's it's the it's the uh, the Reddit group that are destroying the little the little uh, short seller guys are here, right? So it's kind of, it's it, it's kind of interesting. So now that's not it's not a well actually it is the short sellers are the hedge fund guys that are that are uh that are involved in this so now when i look at this short selling strategy uh of all the different you know of all the 12 categories of hedge fund strategies short sellers have the lowest rate of return even long term you look at the whole sector all of them together over 20 years and they made two percent a year it's the lowest rate of return and and again they can occasionally make big bucks when when they're right um, but the reason it's hard is because, you know, most stocks go up most of the time. So, you know what I mean? Like, even if, if you're just a, a lousy investor and you pick a bunch of stocks, most stocks go up most of the time. You just hold them for a while. You probably still make money. You're probably worse than most, you know, most uh, professional managers or indexes, but you, they still go up. So the problem is that you buy, you just buy, you buy a bunch of stocks and most of them go up and you're short them. You need them to go down to make money. And that's why it's just being a short seller. It's just a really hard thing, and that's why you get these, you know, difficult math keep sure of themselves guys that that do it. It's a it's an interesting world, but uh, it's not one that I would suggest that we get into too much. So, uh, category number nine, the next directional strategy is called distressed securities. So this is you'd find a company that's you know major financial. Uh, 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 problems or about to go bankrupt or something like that and um and you either um usually what they do is they go in and and buy it and make a little bit of money from it or often what they do is they go in and make it viable change the management or maybe they take the company and uh split it into parts bankrupt the ones that are no good and make you know get the other ones going again so they often take a company that's going nowhere uh, or going bankrupt and they turn it into one that's making money Okay, so for, this is complex things. So it need to be legal, financial, and business knowledge to be able to do this. So incidentally, in a non-hedge fund way, Warren Buffett started out this way. So Warren Buffett, way back in the 1950s, he was what buying what he called, he called them cigar butts. So he would buy a company on the verge of bankruptcy. An example is Berkshire Hathaway. So Berkshire Hathaway, way back in the 1950s, what happened is it was a textile firm, and textile firms were all getting wiped out by um, by overseas um, uh, companies because you know uh, like making clothes uh, with with um, uh, uh, with sewing machines is, is labor intensive, and you know so they can do that really easily in China or in Asia and make make them in mass. And what's happened? All these textile companies were going under. So Warren Buffett's idea with a cigar butt is, so you know a cigar butt, you walk down the street and you see a, a little short cigar butt that, that someone's thrown out and it's tossed it on the street. And you pull it up and you realize, you know what? I can get three more puffs out of this thing, right? So it's a cigar butt, you get from next to nothing, but you get a little bit out of it. So his idea would... Warren Buffett's idea was he would take a company that is going bankrupt, but still making a profit, like making positive cash flow, but going under, and they, and they real, or it has some assets. So they realized, you know what, it is going bankrupt, but I'm going to make money on it anyway. So that was what he did. And so Berkshire Hathaway was a a company he bought thinking was going bankrupt and because of well it was a complex thing he didn't get his he didn't get what he wanted out of, out of the management ended up getting stuck owning the company and then he put his own he bought it's converted into his big holding company and so in a way it's warren buffett's biggest failure 
And yet it's the company that he now has. It's kind of, you know, for him, it's kind of, he. it's probably not his biggest failure, but it's one of his biggest failures. And that's the name of the company that everybody knows him for. So that's probably, you know, this whole distressed securities thing. So now where you may know of this is from the movie Pretty Woman. Okay, that was actually a really cool movie. Uh, a really nice romantic story. So Richard Gere, the hedge the hedge fund manager in that story, um, what he was do what he did as a business is he would go out and buy a company and then split it into you know five or ten parts and sell them off. And he found if you sell the individual parts, you make more money on it. So that's what he what what he did. So here he'd gone in to buy the share of this uh, you know this company he was going to split up. And then the story is he ended up getting to know the manager, and instead of that, he he turned the company into a viable company instead. Um, you know, without because the the guy didn't the owner of the company didn't want to sell this company that he'd built up to even Richard Gere was offering him a big amount of money. He didn't want his company to be wiped out and all the employees lost. So, but, so that was the strategy that he did he'd buy a company and split it off into parts and sell them off individually and shut down the ones that are, that aren't doing well. So these pe guys often get a bad rap in the press because they, they go into companies and they, and they fire all kinds of people and, and split up the companies and bankrupt some parts of it. And but thing is, they actually have a really good server. Like they, they often take a company that is going bankrupt and they change it somehow. They find out what is good about this company. So let's take the parts that are valuable and make them a new company. So they often, you know, ha have a useful purpose market wise. But uh, you know, the press often just folks uh, focuses on the people that get laid off or, you know, in, in their process. So but anyway, that's an example of this distressed securities. There aren't a lot of fund managers like this and you're going to, you'd have trouble finding out about them. They would be pretty secretive. Strategy number 10 is called manage futures. Okay. So now a future is kind of like uh, we talked about options before, except they're usually longer. There's six to 18 months. And again, it's, it's to buy something in the future uh, at a certain price. So it can be a currency, uh, an index, a commodity, or uh, interest, uh, an interest rate future, you can be different things. So, you know, currency can be, I'm going to convert my Canadian dollars to US dollars at this price, and, you know, in six months. So, so now the most common where managed futures got started is with, um, with farmers, um, trying to get their price. So they're planting this crop. And so the problem with the, the risk of farming is you plant your crop and you work at it all year. And then somehow right near the end of the year, for some reason, the price of that crop plunges and you lose money. So what farmers used to do is when they decided which crop they were going to plant for the year, they'd already, you know, um, buy the, the future. So they have a guaranteed price to that they can sell their crop at in the future. And then so so they're actually they're, it's not just a financial transaction. They're actually going to de deliver it. So the price, the uh, uh, commodity future like that is to sell, I'm going to sell X number of bushels of of wheat uh, in October at this price. And oh, I've already got that price. So now I know I can, I already know what I, how much money I can make this year. So that's where they kind of started out, but then people started trading them. And, and, uh, um, so this strategy is out of all the different hedge fund strategies. This one is known as being the best diversifier from the stock market. So it's the, it's the generally the lowest correlation with the stock market. And, um, you know, it's um, now thing about it is it is kind of a market neutral one. So remember, so when you're buying a, a future or, or an option, the, the, um, they don't generally go up like you know, stocks go up over time. Futures and, and options are a zero uh, are a zero sum game. So with stocks, you know, most people that don't because the stock market goes up, you know, they say the stock market raises all boats, all all investors are making money. With futures and options, it's a zero sum game. So if you made seven dollars and thirty one cents, somebody else lost seven dollars and thirty one cents. And so the reason futures and options often have trouble making money is because it's a zero sum game. The total, like whatever you whatever you made, somebody else lost. And there's costs of transaction costs and all that, so that's that could be kind of the uh, the uh, the issue with it. So managed futures is, is often considered two different strategies: There's the managed and the computer uh, human managed, the computer driven models. So, but so that's the managed futures one. Uh, 
Uh, strategy number 11 is global macro. So there's a couple that are called, these are multiple strategies. So they're not just one strategy, it's a bunch of them. So global macro, they look all over the world and they try to figure out some, what is a trend that's happening around the world and they're going to do something to take advantage of it. Okay. So, and they usually take really big positions based on what they know. And okay, so now this is not like a global equity fund, you know, it's diversified all over the world. They usually take a very, they think something is happening somewhere in the world and they can buy different securities anywhere and they're going to try to take advantage of all this. Okay. So the the best story of this is George Soros. So he's, you know, he's been a global macro manager for decades. And um, so there's the story of where he made a billion, that's with a B, a billion dollars uh, in one day, actually overnight. Uh, while he was sleeping, he made a billion dollars uh, and it was one big uh, position that he took betting against the British pound. So what's happening is uh, Bank of England was trying to prop up its the the British pound and try to keep it even with the German mark. And this was because there were there was the European exchange rate mechanism trying to set up the the uh, the euro. And so they were trying to force the, the uh, British pound to stay even with the German mark, but market conditions weren't suitable to that. And George Soros saw this, you know what, this is going to blow up. They're not going to be able to keep it there. So he borrowed a ton of money and he shorted the British pound. And he and once once he he did it, a bunch of people saw him doing it, a bunch of other people piled onto it. And the, the Bank of England is huge, right? They tried to prop them up, but there was so many people do it. They just, you know, they finally couldn't do it. And the, and the British pound collapsed and they had to get out of the the uh, this European exchange rate me mechanism so but it's basically he saw something the, the basically the the Bank of of England was trying to do something that's not supported by market and George Soros just saw you know what it's going to collapse so uh, so let's just make money on it so so um so you know the truth is that even governments like usually governments are big enough they can force whatever they want but not always sometimes they just get beaten by the markets and uh, you know these global macro guys can do it. So global macro guy, you just have, you need to have really intricate knowledge all over the world of all these different companies. So it's really hard to have a good macro, global macro, but a really interesting strategy. The last strategy is called multi-strategy, and all it is, it's you just instead of having a, a one that's you know just a, for example just a merger arbitrage, we'll have one that does different strategies or different strategies at different times, and these can often be quite steady and a more reliable. A way to buy a hedge fund. And the, the thing is that every hedge fund strategy, uh, like none of them work in all markets. Okay? So that's why they can actually be useful to have a, you know, you do a number of different strategies. So when there's a lot of mergers going on, you're doing merger arbitrage. When there's not a lot of mergers going on, you'll switch to some other different kind of strategy or you have, you know, five different strategies going. So, um, and sometimes what'll be, a, it'll be a fund of funds. They'll buy several different other ones and move it around. So we used to actually, years ago, we used to own a multi-strategy fund. We've had a couple of different ones over the years, and they can be actually be a de decent, uh, you know, de decent investment. So especially if there's something in there that's that they're all not, you know, uh, lower risk uh, targeted funds, that they're all, that some of them are actually out there to make a high rate of return, then you can... Uh, uh, you can do well. Well, one of the uh, one of the funds that we used to own, the mul the multi strategy fund, it was a fund of basically it was a fund of funds. He thought of it like a bit like a baseball, um, like a baseball team. So he had a bunch of different hedge funds, which were like different positions on his baseball team, and some were the hitters, and some were the bunters, and some were the defensive players. And anyway, so but that's uh, multi strategy. So. All right, so it's just I've gone through these strategies and again, just a sense of what they are all, uh, and it's just a fascinating world to look at all of them and and look at all that. So now the question is, so now that we know a bit about what they are, like you know, it's just a good investment. So first of all, are they more risky or less risky than mutual funds and ETFs? And you know, like you tend to think of them as being. There's a lot of rumor. Every, most people generally think of them as more risky. The truth is, for the most part, they're less risky because because risky, depending on how you define risk, they're less volatile. Most of them other than a few, a few strategies, most of the strategies are less volatile. However, they do have, you know, unknown manager risk, the blow up risk, you know, so which is often harder to quantify with a with a risk strategy. So, so when you ask, are, are they more or less risky than mutual funds or head, head uh, or ETFs? To me, it's kind of like asking, are animals big? 
well, some animals are big and some are not big, right? So it's, um, and it's, uh, you know, most are not really big, depending on what you say big is. But that's, so that's, you know, mutual fund, because there's such a huge range. You know, if you take the most aggressive mutual fund and the most conservative one, they have a certain range. But you go to hedge funds, it's a much wider range. You can have much more aggressive ones or much more conservative ones. So it's a much wider range than it is with mutual funds. So, but mostly lower risk. So, now, mutual funds and ETFs usually measure their risk based on standard deviation. So it's market risk. So standard deviation is a statistical measure of uncertainty of rate of return. So how uncertain it is. And that's why they think, you know, for example, stocks are more risky than bonds because they're more uncertain short term. But, but that's, you know, a short term volatility. I've had a few videos about that saying that, you know, like a real investor shouldn't worry about standard deviation or short term volatility. What's important is how reliable is the long term rate of return. So that's the flaw of uh, risk when it comes to mutual funds and ETFs. So now you, but usually the, the, um, the risk measures there are all, you know, one to three year, pretty short year returns. And they're there. It's all based on, you know, statistical measures like standard deviation and sharp ratio and beta and that kind of stuff. So now hedge funds, they have a much, much wider risk. So they'll have this like a hundred different stats and a big one they put this called VAR, money at risk. And part of it is they have this overlay often um, that someone's looking at all these, so remember the, all these different positions they have and see what the overall risk is. So and sometimes it may be hard for the manager to see it. So they've got, you know, they're, they have um, Bank of Montreal and their short uh, RBC, right? And then, but they have a whole bunch of different positions and different things. But sometimes what you don't quite realize is when you look at the whole package, you've got a big exposure to a certain thing. So they have, an, they have really complex software that analyze the entire portfolio to see what the risk is. And for example, they have um, what they call stress testing is they would take all the major market collapses in the last 100 years and say, if they happened today, when we have this portfolio, what would have happened? And so the, the, the risk measures and this massive software they have is for, for hedge funds is immense, immensely more than it is with mutual funds, which is kind of a... It's part of what keeps them from blowing up much the, most of the time so but you know it's you got to understand what uh, what all that is so a big one there is that the, you know out of the statistical ones is they called it r squared so if, for example a hedge fund that we own has r squared is known as how much of the market return is caused by the market so and you know our fund is at r squared of less than 10 percent. so less than 10 percent of the return is related to market and more than 90% is made to the fund manager. So they have all these different, uh, you know, a hundred different statistical measures of risk. So, and they also look at a lot of different risks. So I just found a certain, you know, a little risk, a, a list. So for example, they, they can be capacity risk, event risk, counterparty risk, credit risk, data risk, fraud risk, lack of transparency risk, legal risk, leverage risk, liquidity risk, manager risk, market risk, model risk, operational risk, performance performance measurement risk, pricing risk, regulatory risk. So see, most of these risks, there isn't really a statistic to measure on them. So most of the most of the risks of hedge funds are not actually measurable like that. You have to actually look at each of these areas and see um, you know what the risk is related to it. So a lot of the risks are, you know, they call them theoretical. They're not actually the real risks, but they're, you know, what what's the 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 capacity risk? Like you have a strategy that works, but but they won't work if it gets too big, right? And and you know, if, what if some big event happens, or you know, so th there's things that can go wrong, and some and you know that don't normally go wrong, but they could. So they're real risks. They call them theoretical because you don't really have a statistic, like standard deviation that measures it. So. So now they mostly, the interesting thing is they usually post monthly returns, like the ones I showed you earlier. And you really have to do your manager due diligence. You know, you got to go out and meet the meet the fund manager. I'm going to give you a story about that in a minute. So, um, so again, most growth fund managers, you know, should just, most growth investors should just learn to have a high risk tolerance and, and forget about hedge funds and just take the higher up and down, you know, unless you get a really good fund manager. So, but the, the insight is that the best option for growth investors uh, can be a long short manager that is a long short hedge fund manager that is an all-star fund manager. So it's, you've got a great fund manager already 
now you're getting something that can also uh, short and also has more more tools available to them that can be the best possible uh, investment. So, but mostly, mostly they're less risky, but you know, again, broad range. Now, there have been a few major blowups, and there's interesting stories about them. So the largest and most marketed hedge funds tend to be the ones that blow up, which is interesting. You think that the big ones are safe, but they're usually the riskiest ones. So remember long-term capital, when it blew up in 1997 it, or 1998, it was the biggest hedge fund in the world with the smartest people ever, and it blew up, right? So now the one that people can mo mostly name is Bernie Madoff. Now, the thing about it is, he, you know, everybody thought of it as a hedge fund, but it's not. It was just a scam. So he never actually invested any of the money he had. It was he was not licensed. It was it was not actually an investment. It was just a plain old scam, like a Ponzi scheme, right? So th that's all it was. So the interesting thing about that one that I found really interesting when you watch the story about it is that a whole bunch of risk, risk, rich and sophisticated people bought into it and none of them did any due diligence. You know how I just said you need to do diligence? Uh, but none of them did any due diligence. And how do I know they didn't? Well, because he never invested a single thing. So if they did due diligence, they would have found out he, he owns, that he owns nothing. But he was just a massive, you know, master marketer, got these people to, he made it hard, you know, he tried to not set, make it, he made it elitist, yeah, so most people couldn't buy in, everybody thought, oh, they were lucky to get in. And what happened is, a bunch of the big European banks and richest people in the world had bought shares of these things. When you look at, how, at who lost money on it, it's just a who's who of the the rich and famous and huge banks and and all that and and, and all of them and even there were a bunch of hedge fund funds of funds that are again supposed to do research but again nobody did research they all just kind of thought well you know those other smart people are buying it so and so therefore it must be good i don't do any due diligence on it so that was kind of the story of it it's it's a it was a scam that people bought in because nobody did due diligence and i can tell you nobody that owned it did any due diligence on it so and the guy that that called on it if the movie was kind of interesting was it was a, actually an experienced hedge fund manager that looked at the strategy that bernie madoff claimed to be using and the returns were just way too steady so he basically made 10 percent every year 10 10 10 you know nothing makes steady returns like that you know if it's the 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 um the cost of getting a higher rate of return is that it fluctuates more right if you want a steady return it's a low return if you want a high return they vol it's more volatile but here he just made 10 10 10 that's why everybody seemed to love it it's it's a it makes good money all the time. But, the, you know, for people that, you know, this experienced guy that looked at it, he just says, there's no way you can have returns that steady. It's got to be faked. And it was, he just, he just, it was all made up. He didn't make, he never invested in any of it. There was no rate of return. It was just, it was, it was entirely a scam. Okay, the Bernie Madoff story is not a hedge fund. But it's, it's a lesson that hedge fund investors can learn that you have to do your due diligence and you have to know uh, you have to really understand what the manager is doing, or else you, you know you can get taken advantage of this way. And also, if the returns or or the risk are too good to be real, they might be. So, now the next interesting blow up was a company called Portis. So this was two thousand seven. It was a hedge fund note. So a note it was like a GIC, but it was invested in a hedge fund, and you get the return of the hedge fund. And the principal was guaranteed. After five years, they had a method to be able to do that. And, you know, financial advisors were selling this like mad. It was actually, it was, it was a lot of it was sold here in Canada. And, you know, financial advisors sold it because it just paid the highest commissions and trader fees. They didn't have, they didn't do any due diligence on it. Just, just, oh, we, it pays us double. So let's just, let's just sell it. So now it, uh, it ended up being a scam. However, for some weird, weird, not a well-run scam because, you know, investors ended up getting 95% of their money back on it in the end, which is kind of weird. Now, to me, it was fairly obvious that it was a scam from the beginning. So just starting to read up on it, like lots of people were talking about it and people wanted to, like at our dealer, they wanted to be able to buy into it. Um, but, uh, you know, they had so that. The fund manager, to me, is as soon as I look at a hedge fund, I'm always looking at who's the fund manager. Is he a skilled fund manager? What, what's he doing, right? So they had said, they gave the name of a guy in New York who was the fund manager for it. And then that fund manager denied he was the fund manager. 
Well, well how, what's going on here that he's denying it? So, and then they said, oh, the fund manager is this guy named Boaz Manor. So from our dealer, they, a group of us went down there. I went down there and 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 got to meet him, you know, personally. Just a, a, a couple of us in the room got to talk to him. And Boaz Manor was, he was like 23 with his baby face. And I thought, and he's got no experience. I thought, like, how could this be the fund manager? He doesn't know anything. So I thought, you know what? This is somebody's a kid who's a front. That's what I thought. That's all this is. So, um, and um and that's why I didn't I didn't see the, uh, the the manager of it. And also, when I looked at it, to me, it worked it out. It wasn't a viable business model for the company running it. They were paying such high commissions that they were, you know, the, more than their fees, more than all their fees were just being paid out in commission. So how, how can they even make money doing this? It's got to be a scam. It doesn't make any sense to me. So, um, and in the end, it was this Boaz Manor apparently converted money into diamonds and then eventually fled to Israel. But he did eventually get arrested, and and people got their money back. Most of it, you know, it's it's kind of weird. But you know, from from looking at it, the best I could say to our dealer, from you know my due diligence due diligence on it, was it's possible it's not a scam. Was <laughs> all I could say. When I asked them all about, you know, you guys don't have a viable business model, there they said, well, we're just running this first five years as a lost leader to get a whole bunch of assets, and then we're going to make more money in later on. But um, anyway, it's a weird story. It blew up. Again, nobody did the due diligence on it, and it and it just kind of blew up. So, but it was, to me, as for people who understand it, clearly it was a scam. So then uh, there was another one uh, called North Shield in 2005. Again, uh, this was probably the biggest hedge fund in uh, in Canada at the time. So it was a multi-strategy fund that that, that um, um, invested in many different uh, methods. And actually, they had gotten to be huge. They had a tw like almost a 20-year, very solid, steady uh, record on there. So it looked like actually a really like a really good. Uh, um, really good thing so I, I went down to do the due diligence on it and so i got to usually do, I met with the risk manager and we look at it they did they had this complex software they ran it they were doing all the right things from the risk point of view and you know they they seem to know exactly what they're doing how these different strategies so it kind of seemed to seem to 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 work out now uh as luck would have it, i had my wife along who's a you know a it was a top Bill Carney instructor, personal coach. And so, and she was a business partner with me. So we met the fund manager, his name is John Xanthodaxis. And my wife just didn't like him. He was just, so there was a word called hubris, uh, which is the thing to watch out for. As a manager of hubris, it's when they think they're good, when they think they're, they're God. So he had this like expensive suit and he was looking down on us, you know, uh, down his nose at us and just a, like a real snob. And there were lots of rumors that the company was buying all these office buildings nearby. And and uh, so suddenly I just got this uncomfortable feeling. It just And it was just because of he was such a cocky guy. So, you know, it was a perfect example of hubris. And, you know, the thing blew up. Now, um, this was one that was not originally a scam. It was a good run company, but it got to be too big. So sometimes you try to understand what actually happened on it. So it wasn't actually a scam. It was a properly run company, at least not originally. However, when it blew up, investors lost almost all their money. They only got between 6 and 9% of their money. Almost all of it was lost. And considering the last, you know, the Portis was a scam and they got 95% back, this one wasn't a scam and yet they got hardly anything back. And I think what happened is, once he got to be too cocky, I think it turned into a scam. That's my kind of my my working theory on what happened. And he, and he started using it to buy up his own stuff and funneling money out of it. And um, his story, the fund manager still claims he was innocent and said one company that they invested in sued them and ended up getting most of the money. Uh, and that's so that's why investors lost money. Um, anyway, kind of, kind of a weird story. Uh, but um, so the lesson here to watch out for is watch out for hubris and fund managers. It's a big warning sign. It's when the fund manager gets so cocky and, and just, and, you know, like the, the markets tend to be humbling to people because no matter how brilliant you are, nothing, you're never right all the time. And it's when you think you're just, you know, smarter than God, that's when people should stay away, you know, so um, 
Now there is a thing, uh, there is a risk that's with hedge funds that you don't necessarily get with other uh, with regular mutual funds. It's called counterparty risk, and it's because uh, every trade, every everything you own is um, is held. There's an intermediary that makes the trade happen. So if you're buying, you know, an option or or you're something or selling short, you buy it from this intermediary who sells it to the other company, right? right? So there's always a company that's being able to do that, and that, and also all of your stocks and uh, holdings and short and uh, options and and short positions are all held by a by a specific broker uh, uh, that that a specialized broker that does it for hedge funds now so the interesting thing here is the the biggest um, you know in 2008 when we had the the collapse the the uh, the fed of the states let one of the there's a bunch of the big banks that were having uh, financial difficulties and they let lehman brothers go bankrupt and that ended up being a huge mistake and you know specifically because it was Lehman Brothers, so Lehman Brothers was this counterparty, the whole the the back office for the bulk of the hedge funds in the U.S. And so when they went bankrupt, it wasn't just a bank; it was the biggest. So all these hedge funds with all this tons of trading all over the states got all sucked into it, and that's it was Lehman Brothers collapse that really made it a, a really big a really big collapse. So, so that's the counterparty risk. This is usually the counterparty is a big bank and a solid, but occasionally that can be uh, that can be you know in this case that was actually the big problem. So, all right. So that's kind of uh, you know the, some of the interesting stories of the of the breakups. So let's just talk about the inside of the hedge fund world. So first of all, you know, is it rich people that have most of their money there? And actually, you know, the truth is rich people have most of their money in stocks and bonds and real estate and things. However, the the hedge fund world is mostly rich people. And, you know, I guess you see you have to have it's a high minimum to get in for most people. You have to be accredited investor or a sophisticated investor in a specific uh, definition a definition of, for them. Now, remember, so if you're working with these independent for portfolio managers with a fiduciary duty, you can get around all you can get past that and anybody can buy them if their portfolio manager buys it for them so so but it is mostly the big uh, rich people that that tend to buy any of them and they're targeted for rich people so and remember so mostly about steadier returns and not higher rated return so on average returns are probably are lower than what the stock market does um, however, you know, it's funny when you talk to a lot of rich people, what a lot of them will often tell you is that they're not really interested in making money. They just want to protect the money they have. They say, look, I'm already rich. I don't need a good rate of return. I just don't want to lose it. So they go to a strategy like this where they think I'm getting more steady rate of return. Um, so, um, so, you know, there's a perception that rich people are doing it and they're making huge returns. What the actual thing is, Rich people are doing it, but they're generally making lower returns than us, you know, the regular people that invest in, you know, mutual funds and ETFs and the, and the stock market and to get the stock market level return. So another question is, are they secret? And yeah, to, to some extent they are, there's a, I call them semi-secret. So uh, quite a few of them just sell by word of mouth. And part of it is if you get, some of these strategies don't work if they get too big. So they just sell to a few of their friends and a few people that they get to know and they don't let it get any bigger. And it's just only sold by word of mouth. So it's hard even to find out about them and what, who they even are and what their rate of returns are and stuff. So a lot of them, they're not listed on Morningstar or, or, or anything like that. They don't publish their returns returns they're not on they're not available on the internet so um now there are some specific hedge fund industry papers like the Kenyan hedge watch where you can see that it's a magazine that you can subscribe to and get a list list of the different hedge funds there's also industry conferences the biggest one's called the the world alternative investment summit of canada WASC. W-A-I-S-C, uh, and it's about alternative investments now alternative investments includes hedge funds but a whole bunch of other things as well so, but there's different places like this where you can find out about them. Uh, but, you know, most of them um, don't publish. They only publish their holdings once a year at the end of the year that, where they're required to. But in between, you don't know what they're what they're holding. So you really got to know who the, what the manager is. So what he's doing. Um, so many can make good returns um, with a modest amount of money, but not with a lot of money. And that's why they, they intentionally don't get too big. And that's why they don't market much. And sometimes it's, so that's why it's the ones that the really big hedge funds that do lots of marketing are often the most likely to be a scam. 
So, and I think quite a bit of it also is because see a lot of the risks are theoretical. Um, there are all things you can't theoretical is and you can't put a you know financial statistic on it. Um, the regulators are also trying to keep it away from the average person. Uh, some of that is in, you know holding us back, but some of them also the average person shouldn't be buying into these because these are sophisticated. You really have to know what you're doing with them. So, now, are they unregulated? Not really. So it's it's a lower regulation. So they're sold through what's called offering memorandum instead of prospectus. So the regulation is quite a bit lower, but they're still regulated um, in general. So rules that they have to follow. Uh, are they super complex? Yes, they are. Because remember, it's not an investment. A hedge fund is not an investment. It's a strategy. So it's every hedge fund strategy. It's a combination of holdings that are a combination for some reason. So that's why it's it's hard to look at them. And you know what? If you looked at the portfolio, you probably wouldn't understand what it is because they have all these different holdings or they own some and they're short a bunch of other things. You think, what are they doing? And you realize, well, that one and this one over here, these two are a pair that make this strategy. And these other ones are a strategy that make this. So it's, you know, it's it's really hard to understand. Even if you saw the portfolio, a lot of times you wouldn't know what the heck they're doing from it. You can't you really got to, uh, you know, understand the strategy. You have to understand the strategy. The And then once you understand the strategy, often you understand what the benefits and the risks of that strategy are. And then you got to get to know the fund manager and how good is he at, at, at doing this kind of thing. So, um, now, what kind of people manage hedge funds? So some of them are just former mutual fund managers, and most of them are just kind of run of the mill. Not, you know, they may be good fund mutual fund managers. There's usually the better fund mutual fund managers, but the bulk of them aren't very good at being a hedge fund. It's a different skill. But the odd one is, and that's maybe the best choice. Uh, a lot of these um uh, various strategies other than the long short a lot of the other sophisticated arbitrage strategies it's really sophisticated people running these things so <clears throat> uh, maybe a lot of uh, math geeks the short sellers especially are kind of these arrogant super math geeks but so i mean that's kind of the people that are involved in there it's a lot of it is a sophisticated group that's marketing to to the wealthy people and they keep things pretty quiet and, and you know among their buddies and and you can only find out in certain conferences or or, or certain things so um but there is certain there are some that you could find and, and some of them are, are are possibly the best ones so remember a lot of the secretive stuff is the low risk stuff that the rich people want but it actually makes a low rate of return and so if you have a, if you have the risk tolerance you don't actually need to do to be able to do that Okay, so now should you invest in a hedge fund? So remember, so a lot of a hedge fund is about having a steady rate of return. And I think there's a fear-based mindset that's behind it. And so often it's better, you know, to get your higher rate of return. Now, I've had this in a bunch of different uh, previous talks where I talked about, you know, it's you need a higher return, like 8%, like an equity return, not a balanced return of 5% to be able to retire. And, you know, they, you know, if you want to retire comfortably, in most cases, I have a bunch of examples in other videos, you need to invest between 35 and 50% of your gross income, which is basically impossible if you're with a 5% rate of return. But all you do is invest for a bit more risk. You get more ups and downs, but you only have to invest 13 to 20%. So that's really the only way that, that you can invest that you can retire comfortably. And so even if you're going for a, you know, instead of a balanced portfolio, you have a hedge fund that's, you know, lower rate and more steady, um, you often, you're still better off just going with an equity portfolio because you need that, you know, you want to be able to get 8% or higher rate of return over the over the long term. And, you know, so I've had these articles about the death of bonds because I think, you know, to me is bonds is a, is a crappy investment for people who actually have a retirement plan and want to retire com comfortably. And hedge Hedge funds are, are sometimes perceived as being a bond alternative. Instead of buying these crappy bonds, I'm going to get a steadier return with a hedge fund. That's kind of, thought, you know, maybe they're a, hedge, a bond an alternative instead of having bonds or fixed income in my portfolio. But they can be some of the same problem if you're giving up a lot of your, uh, you know, you know, a lot of your return. So now the way um, to, to be able to work with equity, equities are going to have more ups and downs short term, but it's risk tolerance is a learned skill, 
right? It's it's the basically it's the ability to do nothing when your investments go down. And just and you know what? The stock market has reliably bounced back from 100 percent of declines, 90 percent of the time within a year or two. So you're you're much and the returns are quite reliable as a long term rate of return. So you can just learn to understand what stocks do. And you know, for example, compared to bonds, so this is a mess, standard deviation which shows risk. So you know what uh, stocks are more risky. Uh, uh, standard deviation is uh, uncertainty of returns. So stocks are more risky for one, two, and five-year periods, but they're actually le more predictable, less risky than bonds over 20 and 30-year periods after inflation. So they see they, they are reliable long-term. So if you so it's important to have this growth mindset. And if you do, you may dismiss most of the hedge fund world as, uh, you know, they're just trying to get a steady return, but they're not actually trying to give me the return that I need to be able to retire comfortably. So with the growth mindset, you think long term, you just do things differently. And I can just, you know, that equities are reliable long term, not short term, but they are a lot in a, reliable long term. You know, nobody knows what the markets are going to do this year or any, any short term period, but long term is obvious, you know. So based on any period in the in the modern uh, stock market, uh, uh 25 years later, the market's between 7 and 17 times higher. So it's just a reliable thing. So rather than trying to get a lower more steady return, why not just embrace the ups and downs? Be confident in the market long term and just get a higher rate of return and retire more comfortably that way. This is another way of looking. So this is from 1800, 220 years of returns. And notice the stocks, how steady the returns are long term, you know, much more steady than bonds. So and here again, 25 year periods of time with the S&P 500. Notice every every time, every 25 year return is at a good rate of return. And the modern stock market, which starts around here, you know, 1930s. 25 years ending in the 50s. The worst rate of return has been about 8% a year. So the market is reliable as a long-term investment. Why do we need to go to hedge funds you know, to have a more steady rate of return when we can just learn to live with the ups and downs? But if you can't live with the ups and downs, then I would suggest a hedge fund is probably better choice than having a balanced portfolio and, and fixed income. A hedge fund is a better way to get a steadier rate of return, but you'd need advice to be able to you know, understand the fund manager. So should you invest in a hedge fund? Um, most are too low a return to retire comfortably. Um, the long short ones are like a mutual fund on steroids, and they can be the best choice if you have a hedge fund with an all-star fund manager, that can be the single best choice in the hedge fund world. And that can even be better than anything in the mutual fund or ETF world if you get a hedge fund with an all-star fund manager. So now again, our portfolio manager does own one. He's also a, like an insider in the hedge fund world, knows a bunch of the hedge funds. And um, so we have one uh, at the moment that's within within our portfolio. And they may 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 or may not be in the future we you know we may add them but but this fund manager has actually done he also manages a mutual fund has done better than his mutual fund so so that can be the really good way to get in into the hedge fund world is to um is to get um an all-star fund manager managing a long short hedge fund so and i remember if you're with an uh, independent portfolio manager you're automatically considered an accredited investor if you're buying one of his standard portfolios so that way you can you know he's got a fiduciary duty to do what's in your best interest and this is a way that you can get into it without having to you know put 150,000 in one fund or something so um now the advice is only invest uh, with with hedge funds, if you have a knowledgeable advisor, uh, remember this is a strategy, not an investment. It's it's all dependent upon the manager's skill. You have to understand what's going on. Uh, it's much more complicated uh, to understand that with than with you know the mutual fund or hedge or ETF or the the market. These are more complicated. And if you don't understand what you're doing, you're doing no due diligence. You can make the mistake of the you know that the people in in uh, with Bernie Madoff did, where they oh they invested because because all these other smart people did and they, you know, but nobody did their, their due diligence on it. So only invest with them if you are an expert or you're working with an expert who's, who would, who's advising you on them. All right. So what we learned today is, you know, the, the what is a hedge fund, the inside secret world. We learned what is a hedge fund. I gave you an example of it. We talked about the pros and cons of hedge funds versus, you know, mutual funds and ETFs. We looked at the 12 different categories of hedge fund strategies. Are they more risky or less risky than mutual funds and ETFs? Uh, I gave you some interesting stories about the major blowups. And we talked about the movies that, that are the hedge fund world. So lots of stories in this area. So it's a really neat and uh, 
very broad area. And I just gave you a view of the inside, uh, what the hedge fund world is like. Should you invest in a hedge fund and why do our clients have one? So thanks a lot for listening. Uh, my name is Ed Rimple. My blog is Unconventional Wisdom. It's the number one blog in Canada for a financial planner. I also have a YouTube channel, and I'm about to launch a podcast. Stay tuned for that. Um, if, you, um, if you're interested in talking with us, just go to my blog. Hit um, It's www.edremple.com. Hit contact, and you can request a free 30-minute consultation. That's just to find out what you're looking for and whether we're a fit to work together. And if you subscribe to my blog, and podcast and also the podcast that's coming up or a YouTube channel. All that means is you get um, my new article or video or podcast sent to you automatically to your email uh, every Thursday. I'm trying to do one every Thursday. Thanks a lot for listening and we'll see you next week.